Charles, their first child, was born in 1930. But the Lindberghs suffered a parent's worst nightmare when the little boy disappeared from their home on March the 1st, 1932. When the frantic parents searched his room, they found a ransom note demanding $50,000 on the windowsill. A roughly made ladder lay on the ground outside. Retired school teacher John Condon offered his services as a go-between and was able to strike up communication with the kidnappers through classified advertisements in the Bronx Home News. A sleeping suit sent through the mail convinced the Lindberghs that the contact was legitimate. On April the 2nd, after receiving an anonymous phone call, Condon delivered a ransom of $50,000 in new bills and $20,000 in soon to expire gold currency to a man who handed him a note claiming the boy was being held on a boat at Martha's Vineyard. But when Lindbergh went to the marina, there was no sign of his child. In desperation, he flew a low pass over the boats in the hope of flushing the kidnappers out. But there was no sign, and he realized they'd been duped. A month later, baby Charles' decomposed body was found near the Lindbergh home, escalating the matter to a murder investigation. The New York City Police, Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the State Police combined forces to track down the perpetrators. On September the 15th, 1934, they had a breakthrough. A suspicious gas station attendant noted down the license number of the car driven by a man who'd paid with one of the ransom gold certificates. German-born carpenter Richard Hauptmann was soon arrested, and authorities found the remaining ransom money hidden in his garage. Hauptmann protested his innocence, arguing that the money and gold certificates had been left by his friend Isidore Fisk, who had since died. But both Lindbergh and Condon testified that Hopman's voice was the one they'd heard when the ransom was delivered. And the discovery of a notebook with construction plans for a similar ladder to the one found at the scene of the crime, and forensic evidence that the wood for the ladder came from Hopman's house, helped seal his fate. At the trial, experts testified that Hopman's handwriting matched the ransom letters. Hopman was found guilty for both kidnapping and murder, and was electrocuted on April the 2nd, 1936. The Lindberghs left for an extended stay in England after receiving death threats against their second son and unwanted attention from the paparazzi. And the case led to the Lindbergh Law, which made the crime of kidnapping a federal offense. In the 80s, he was a chart-topping superstar, selling millions of albums around the world. But as well as the heights of fame, Culture Club's Boy George has also experienced the depths, battling drug addiction for more than two decades and losing two close friends to heroin. George's association with drugs and the people who take them led to a very public arrest in 2005. He was charged with cocaine possession after police found 13 bags of the drug in his New York apartment when they responded to a burglary report. The case was heard in Manhattan Criminal Court in March 2006, and the singer, who was born George O'Dowd, pleaded guilty to falsely reporting a burglary. He was sentenced to five days of community service and fined $1,000. The judge dropped the drugs charges, which could have meant a prison sentence of up to five years, but ordered George to attend drug rehabilitation. The singer maintained the drugs did not belong to him, but had been left behind after a party. His lawyer said George was looking forward to putting the incident behind him and getting on with his career. He was relieved. Uh, I'm relieved. His manager, Jeremy Pierce, who's here, is relieved. Uh, I, I think there was a cloud uh, over George's head while this case was pending, and now he's free to get on with his life, and he feels uh, very much relieved. George's manager said a criminal conviction would not affect the British-born singer's U.S. residency. He's free to come back and work here now. Um, he's very, very popular in America, as he is everywhere, as a DJ, and he'll come back and do more of that, for sure. And we hope he'll come back and play concerts in due course as well. But only a couple of months later, George was back in court, being threatened with jail for not carrying out his community service sentence. 
Criminal Court Judge Anthony Ferrara gave George two months to complete the five days of community service. Defense lawyer Louis Freeman had argued in court that the singer was hoping to avoid the humiliation of dragging a rake around a city park and wanted to work with an AIDS charity. But the judge appeared angry and insisted that George would be treated the same as any other offender. He told him it was up to the singer to make his community service an exercise in humiliation or an exercise in humility, adding that if boy George did not complete his community service, he would be jailed. George duly appeared on the streets of New York and completed the sentence, his actions recorded by a big posse of media. In 1995, George recounted his drug-induced fall from grace and how he had finally kicked his heroin habit in the autobiography, Take It Like a Man. Later, he made a new career as a disc jockey and record producer. The second volume of George's memoirs, Straight, spent six weeks on the best sellers list in 2007. He continues to tour and perform as a solo artist around the world. Coming up, the assassination of JFK. When an assassin's bullets ended the life of popular young President John F. Kennedy, the world was saddened and bewildered by the incomprehensible crime. In November 1963, Kennedy was in the prime of his life. Public admiration of the charismatic young family reached such proportions that the White House became known as Camelot after the popular musical about the life of the mythical King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. His presidency had seen controversy with a botched invasion of Cuba, the world on the brink of nuclear war during a missile crisis, and an escalating military commitment in Vietnam. But Kennedy was also using his considerable popularity to forge ahead on civil rights and push for a nuclear test ban treaty. Kennedy was a doting father to his children Caroline and John, but 1963 brought heartache for him and his wife Jacqueline with the death of their newborn son Patrick in August. Behind the facade of the happy family, the Kennedys were grieving deeply for the loss of their little boy. On the 22nd of November, the President and First Lady traveled to Dallas, Texas to gather support for Kennedy's re-election in a state that had only backed his initial bid by a small margin. In a 1961 Lincoln Continental, the couple was part of a motorcade that drove through Dealey Plaza on its way to the Dallas trademark. Despite a recent security scare involving America's ambassador to the United Nations, the Secret Service told Dallas police not to assign their usual armed posse of homicide police to the rear of the motorcade. At about 12.30 p.m., shots were fired from a nearby book depository, hitting Kennedy in the upper back and head, fatally wounding him and injuring the governor of Texas. Less than half an hour later, the president was declared dead. A doctor in the emergency room at Parkland Hospital later told an official commission that the president was so severely wounded there was never any hope of saving him. A priest administered the last rites, but the president was already dead. Kennedy's death plunged the United States into mourning. The world was paralyzed with shock. Less than a thousand days into his presidency, America's youthful hope for the future was lying in a coffin, and the era of Camelot was at an end. The country's three major television channels suspended their regular programming to bring round-the-clock updates of the biggest news story in history. The United Nations General Assembly joined in a minute of silent tribute to the man who had fought so hard for the ideals of international cooperation. For a short moment, Cold War hostilities were suspended as East and West united in sorrow. Jackie Kennedy accompanied her husband's body on the flight home, still clothed in the same blood-stained raspberry-colored dress she had been wearing when her husband was murdered next to her. She bravely stood beside Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson 
as he was sworn in as the 36th President of the United States in an unorthodox ceremony on Air Force One. The aircraft touched down at Andrews Air Force Base and the President's body was rushed to Bethesda Naval Hospital for an autopsy. Doctors concluded that Kennedy had been struck by two bullets and that the second bullet, which had hit his head, had been fatal. However, this testimony was not enough to prevent controversy. Possible inconsistencies in the angles of the bullets that penetrated Kennedy and the governor, and the evidence that there might have been more than three gunshots, have led to many conspiracy theories about the assassination. The president's flag-draped coffin was taken to the White House and placed in the East Room in private repose, then moved to the Capitol the following day to lie in state until the funeral. On the 25th of November, Kennedy's state funeral procession traveled through the streets of the nation's capital, watched live on television by millions of people. The day was also Kennedy's son's third birthday, and little John cut a heartbreaking figure when he saluted his father's coffin as he stood with his mother and older sister Caroline. Thrust into the spotlight, new President Lyndon B. Johnson faced the difficult task of reassuring a traumatized people that political life would go on. He spoke at a press conference at Andrews Air Force Base, moments after arriving with the president's body. This is a sad time for all people. We have suffered a loss that cannot be weighed. For me, it is a deep personal tragedy. I know that the world shares the sorrow that Mrs. Kennedy and her family bear. I will do my best. That is all I can do. I ask for your help and God. A massive manhunt was launched to find the assassin who'd been glimpsed in the sixth floor window of the book depository. Less than two hours later, a police officer was shot and killed. When the suspect was apprehended, officials realized he fitted the assassin's description. Their suspicions increased when they discovered that he was the only employee of the book depository who was unaccounted for. Lee Harvey Oswald was a 24-year-old malcontent whose short but colorful life had included a stint in the Marine Corps, where he learned marksmanship and a short-lived affection to the Soviet Union. An avowed Marxist, Oswald had recently moved to Texas from New Orleans, where he'd been involved in both pro and anti-Castro activities. Oswald denied shooting Kennedy, arguing he'd been set up as a patsy. He was interrogated for two days. On November the 24th, Oswald was being moved to the Dallas County Jail when he was confronted by nightclub owner Jack Ruby, who shot him dead in the basement of Dallas Police Headquarters. Ruby claimed to be getting revenge for Kennedy's death, but conspiracy theorists claim Ruby's close connections with organized crime figures Sam and Joe Campisi shows the mob was involved in an assassination plot to kill the head of an administration that was getting tough on crime. Ruby was convicted of murder in March 1964, but died of cancer before he could be put to death. In the months before he died, he was said to have told his psychiatrist that he'd been framed for Oswald's murder. However, just before his death, Ruby made a final statement saying that he alone had been responsible for Oswald's murder. Whether it was a conspiracy or the work of just one man, the assassination of John F. Kennedy remains one of the world's most infamous crimes. Coming up, did Lizzie Borden murder her parents? In his 16 years in the music business, rapper Kelvin Broders, aka Snoop Dogg, has seen out some significant controversies. A 1993 arrest following the death of gang member Philip Wildermariam in Los Angeles led to a high-profile murder trial. Broders and his bodyguard McKinney Lee, who pulled the trigger, claimed they were acting in self-defense. 
The jury agreed and acquitted both men, but the case ignited a raging debate over whether the incendiary and provocative lyrics of gangster rap contributed to violence or was just a reflection of the world inhabited by its creators. In 2005, Broders hit the headlines again, this time accused of raping 36-year-old makeup assistant Kylie Bell. But just before the case was made public, the rapper went on the offensive, suing her for extortion. Both lawsuits were eventually dropped. But the law wasn't finished with the troubled rapper, who was back in court in 2007, pleading no contest to felony gun and drug charges. His attorney argued Broders needed the marijuana for health reasons. Snoop does have a valid uh, medical marijuana certificate and in no way intends uh, to violate uh, the uh, parameters of the health and safety code in this regard. The 35-year-old agreed to five years probation and 800 hours of community service under terms of the ruling. The court also banned Brodus from having any gang members in his entourage and ordered him to provide a DNA sample. With a no contest plea, Brodus avoided a conviction and what could have been up to four years in prison. And he was given a strong incentive to stay on the straight and narrow. He knows that he will go to state prison, no ifs, ands, or buts, if he violates probation. It's very, very important. The charges stem from an incident in Burbank, California. Brodus was arrested on suspicion of transporting marijuana, and police then found a gun at his home. Brodus already had a 1993 conviction for gun possession. Following this, the musician said he wanted to be known for more than his indiscretions. Just the negative press, they always paint me out to be a bad boy, you know. You never hear about the good things that I do, you know what I'm saying? You always hear about the you know, the run-ins that I have with the law as opposed to the things that I do in the positive life. But Broder's run-ins with the law have already affected his travel plans, with both Britain and Australia refusing him a visa because of his record. However, the rapper says those problems are now behind him, and he wants to focus on performing. I'm the real American gangster, and I would like to do a movie based on that in uh, London, because London has a real fetish for that gangster style music and uh, music and movies and Beckham is a fan of it so hopefully we'll come together and create a movie or something. Whether or not the two team up professionally remains to be seen but one thing Broders is sure about is that he has some big things ahead. His new family based reality show Snoop Dogg's Fatherhood aims to show there's a more sensitive side to the gangster rapper. The man who put the shizzle dizzle into music is hoping his legal problems are a thing of the past. That is not deal with my family. That's personal issues that me and the law have, have ran into each other with. And um, that's all behind me. Now I'm on probation now as we speak. So, you know, I put all that behind me. It was just a little mishap that I had, a misunderstanding. So we got understanding and now we're moving forward. And now the positive things that I do in life will be broadcast as opposed to the so-called negative things. There's life in the old Snoop Dogg yet. Since the September 11 terrorist attacks, there's been a rising fear that the United States could be the target of a biological or chemical assault. On October the 5th, 2001, American media photo editor Robert Stevens died after inhaling anthrax spores from a deliberately infected letter. A couple of weeks later, two postal workers were killed by the same strain of anthrax. Investigation showed that a series of anthrax-laced letters was sent to various American organizations However, the crime remains unsolved. The US State Department directed all missions based outside the United States to have a three-day supply of the antibiotic Chipro for all employees. But some say civilian stockpiling of Chipro is not a good idea. It's still not worth for the public person to have it. Our embassy people are at a much higher risk. There's a window of opportunity when you can start the treatment, and that is 24 to 48 hours. If you will start within 48 hours your antibiotics um, and, and get the full treatment, you're perfectly safe, you're perfectly in good shape. The FBI unsuccessfully attempted to locate the source of the anthrax. Officials stressed that the exposure was limited to the building and that previous attempts to use anthrax in a biological attack against civilians had never been successful. The US government keeps a stockpile of medicine, including Chipro, on hand in case of a biological attack.
Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. For more than a century, the story behind this schoolyard ditty has intrigued America. Did Lizzie Borden really murder her father and stepmother in cold blood? Or did somebody else commit the gruesome murder? August the 4th, 1892, started like any day in the quiet New England town of Fall River. But late that morning, Irish maid Bridget Sullivan was startled to hear the 32-year-old daughter of the house call out to her that someone had murdered her father. Lizzie said she found Andrew Borden slumped on the sitting room sofa. When the doctor arrived, he discovered that the head wounds were so severe, one of Andrew's eyes was severed. The body of Lizzie's stepmother, Abby, was found upstairs in the guest room. She'd also been bludgeoned to death in a frenzied attack. It didn't take long for police to finger Lizzie as a suspect. She'd had opportunity, and with evidence coming out that her father planned to change his will to make his second wife the main beneficiary, she had motive. The problem was there didn't appear to be any blood on her clothing. Police found a hatchet in the cellar, which they assumed to be the murder weapon but it was too clean. A few days later, one of Lizzie's friends saw her burning a dress in the kitchen stove. Lizzie said she'd wrecked it by brushing against some wet paint, but testimony about the dress was enough to prompt a judge to commit Lizzie to trial for murder. When the case was heard later that year, the prosecution attempted to tie together circumstantial evidence to connect Lizzie to the crime, but with no conclusive proof, the jury took just an hour to acquit her of all charges. Lizzie inherited her father's fortune, but spent the rest of her life a social outcast. She died in 1927, taking the truth to her grave.